Greetings, welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing abrupt climate change. And uh, thank you all for your participation in the comment section <clears throat> for the last video. It seemed, well, it seems about normal as far as uh, the number of comments, but it seems like I'm getting a lot of comments from new viewers, um, lots of new opinions and new voices, and I'm, I'm very excited about that. <clears throat> um, I think the viewership of this channel is growing, of course, um, you know, incrementally, uh, since nobody, you know, wants to necessarily hear this news, but um, it is something that people are becoming more aware of and um, something people are willing to engage in conversations about, knowledge about. And it really is just a matter of reaching some kind of a tipping point <clears throat> some kind of, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, mass understanding that, you know, this is a serious issue. Um, again, whether or not we can do anything about it in time is a, an entirely other uh, story. <clears throat> um, so I have to apologize uh, profusely. Uh, yesterday I was talking about a video by Roger Hallam and I think I said Robert I was kind of tired and out of it as you can you know my skin tone is about you know kind of getting back to normal but I was extremely sunburnt and kind of wiped out yesterday when I did that video and I said Robert and that sent a whole lot of people looking for Robert Howland or you know people were just looking for the wrong name so um, some of y'all gave people the right link. I think most of you have probably seen the video. If you have not seen it, I will link it in this video in the description box so you all can watch um, the entire video. It's really, really good. And the other thing I, um, I didn't talk about concerning that video uh, yesterday was, you know, he, he lays out the case for the, um, the very solid fact that we are in uh, a whole lot of trouble. And despite that, <clears throat> despite the rock solid, Loctite, airtight um, case for, uh, you know, the likelihood of our demise, he also lays out uh, ways in which people can take action. And uh, I also thought that was um, a quite admirable. And he had some very interesting ideas about that. Uh, one of which was, you know, of course, if you if you confront people, if you tell people they're wrong, if you're, um, if you're, you know, if you're angry about people or confront them in a kind of a hostile way, then the ego gets involved. This was at the very end of the video. And he was trying to say like, look, you know, if you, at any cost, if you can um, try and talk to people about this issue or negotiate about the reality of this issue with them in a way that's, um, not challenging necessarily to someone's ego, you can get a lot farther. Um, and, and he also says something very, um, very astute, which is, uh, that most people are, most people are emotional slash psychological as opposed to, um, logical, you know, um, and especially if somebody feels like they're wrong or they, they are in the wrong standpoint or they're on the wrong side of an issue, um, a lot of times people will, will absolutely defend uh, their wrongness because they would rather be right than accept that they were wrong. And of course, you know, this is a, this is a, a major flaw in the human um, experiment in the human psyche but uh you know if you can give people an out uh on any level if you can treat them with respect also um you know i know we all we all go through and i myself go through um you know moments of uh you know rage um anger whatever uh incredulousness around people not being able to um, see the truth of, of where we're at, the reality of the science. It's pretty, pretty obvious, but 
but still, um, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about teachable moments. Um, and it is always incumbent on the person uh, who's operating in higher consciousness to figure out how it is that they're going to bring people up to raise their consciousness. You're not going to shame people into raising their consciousness. You're just not. Um, it's, it, you know, as much as it feels good to rant and to vent and to call people names, and I certainly have days where I really want to call people names and um, not bother with with uh, educating. It really is. Um, it really is the responsibility of those who know to educate those who don't know, and that's who we are. We are people who know. We know better. And we need to find ways in order to get this message across so that uh, people aren't immediately defensive. <clears throat> um, I am constantly trying to look for ways to do that, even though I fall short every single day in many ways. Um, excuse me. What else do I have to say? Um, yeah, so also uh, in the Roger Hallam video, uh, he also talks about um, actions that take, uh, that can cause structural change. And, and obviously, you know, a million people marching in the street doesn't do jack for anybody. It really doesn't. Um, he's talking about the fact that the things that actually cause um, people in power to actually uh, to take notice or wake up is that when people actually go get arrested, when people put themselves in jail for a cause, uh, that, that this seems to have more concrete, uh, direct uh, effect on, um, on policy. Uh, for the most part, I mean, I guess I agree with him. It's an interesting theory. Uh, I haven't, you know, we actually do see uh, environmental protesters go to jail. We've seen quite a few of them uh, go to jail. There was, a, you know, the Earth First movement was um, pretty prominent uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. And there were people, you know, there are people getting put in jail. I don't see it. I don't really see it stemming the tide. I don't see it changing people's minds, I think. Um, and I'm not here to boo-hoo what he's talking about. I, I think that what he's saying has merit. Um, but we live in a different age. We live in a different, the way people take in information. So back in the 60s, when, when people were getting arrested and, um, you know, in the, in the civil rights movement, you know, you, you saw people, you know, seeing this happen and waking up and going, oh, my God, like, I can't believe, uh, he also talks about this too, the reaction of people to, to you know, somebody getting brutally uh, stomped out or arrested or dragged, you know, off to jail, like it actually creates more momentum on your side. So that's why it is, is effective. But the thing is, is actually people have to see this and, um, and people have to care about this. Uh, so do more people need to go put themselves uh, in prison? Um, maybe so. I do believe that in the day and age of social media and uh, media in general, you know, outrage, the outrage phenomenon, it doesn't, it doesn't change much, you know, a lot of, in a lot of, a lot of instances, it does not change much, but there are instances in which enough noise and enough um, momentum behind something can be, uh, can be cause for change. I, I, you see it happen every once in a while, not all the time, but if, if people can make a concerted effort to keep an issue, you know, hot, to keep an issue on the, on the front burner, um, then I think it can affect change. However, this is also, um, you know, in relation to uh, the problem that you're fighting against and how, how much, you know, how much the powers that be really don't care about your position, um, you know, but we, the media is driving a lot of stuff that, you know, um, and it's really hard 
to get uh, public opinion and public consensus about something or even public visibility around something because the media is not um, going to give you that opportunity. Um, they're going to bury uh, your issue if they don't like what you're talking about. And, and so that's makes it exponentially harder to get uh, <clears throat> to get things uh, going. Anyways, again, very interesting video. I will link it again in the description box in this video. So if anybody uh, is still looking for this video, it will be in this, the description box below. Uh, moving on. Well, that takes me right into this article uh, from Truth Out from today. Percentage of Americans who believe climate change is real reaches new high. Over the course of the last decade, the National Surveys on Energy and Environment has surveyed Americans to determine if they believe there is solid evidence of global warming. The most recent NSEE survey conducted, conducted during April and May of 2018 found that 73% of Americans now think there is solid evidence of global warming, a level higher than the previous record of 72% uh, revealed during the fall of 2008. The survey is the fifth straight survey in which at least 70% of Americans thought there is evidence that temperatures on the planet are rising. Solid majority of those surveyed, 60%, now believe human activity is at least partially responsible for this warming, with 34% saying humans are primarily responsible and 26% saying they're partially responsible. The combined 60% that believes humans are at minimum contributing to global warming surpasses the previous record of 58%. There, there is, however, a striking partisan divide among Democrats, Republicans, and independents on whether global warming is occurring. The most recent NSEE findings indicate this divide is large and modestly widening, with the gap between Democrats and Republicans as large as 40%. 90% of Democrats think there is solid evidence of global warming, while 50% of Republicans maintain this, this same view. So what? We all know public policy doesn't track public opinion. Um, these results are good news, I think. Uh, now readers may disagree and despair the significant minority of people who don't think climate change is real and that humans are causing it, to that I retort that at least the numbers are improving, albeit slightly. And this despite massive astroturfing campaigns mounting, mounted to the contrary by fossil fuel interests. For more on that score, see this recent the Smog blog post. Does this incremental shift in public matter? Uh, I would hope so. We all know, I think they meant to say public opinion matter. Uh, we all know that there's a huge disconnect between public opinion and public policy in the United States due to the money-driven political system. What that means in this regard is that even with a solid proportion of people believing in climate change caused by humans, those percentages alone won't over override the resources the fossil fuel industry can pour into maintaining the current disastrous system. A couple of points. First, the higher those numbers, the more solid the support for beliefs the more difficult it is for all politicians to ignore public opinion, particularly those political figures who are exploring alternative mechanisms for financing their campaigns that don't involve auctioning off their principles to the highest bidder. Second, even at the level of oligarchs and their minions, however much the fossil fuel industry wants to continue to drill baby drill and frack till you drop, everyone's not on board with such a program. Uh, some industries will no doubt profit significantly from uh, a shift away from fossil fuel economy to a more sustainable system. And we would expect money from those industries devoted to measures to address climate change. Also, money alone won't protect the rich from the disastrous climate changed future that's emerging. And so it's unsurprising to see some of the rich, express, uh, especially tech stalwarts, embrace the green energy mantra. Overall, this means I expect some political money spent on a different vision that the Kochs no doubt abhor, but which might benefit all of us. State level action, some cause for minor optimism at the moment. All is not completely lost. The Trump administration's dreadful environmental record notwithstanding. And I tend, uh, and a trend I should point out that can only be expected to worsen despite EPA administration Scott Pruitt's recent resignation. States such as California continue to pursue saner policies, and some of these policies 
put states on a collision course with the feds. I'll note here that California last week reported some success in mitigating greenhouse gas pollution, according to the California Air Resource Board press release. The California Air Resources Board today announced the greenhouse gas pollution in California fell below 1990 levels for the first time since emissions peaked in 2004, an achievement roughly equal to taking 12 million cars off the road or saving 6 billion gallons of gasoline a year. California set the toughest emissions targets in the nation, tracked progress, and delivered results, said Governor Edmund G. Brown, Jr. The next step is for California to cut emissions below 1990 levels by 2030, a heroic and very ambitious goal. Under Assembly Bill 32, passed in 2006, California must reduce its emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. The 2016 Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory published today shows that California emitted 429 metric, a million metric tons of climate pollutants in 2016, a drop of 12 million metric tons, or 3% from 2015. In California, we see the impacts of climate change all around us, but our efforts to curb its worst impacts are on track. We are well, uh, we are well in California to see, blah, 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 hold on. In California, we see the impacts of climate change all around us, but our efforts to curb its worst impacts are on track. We are well positioned to meet the challenge of the 2030 target, said CARB Chair. Mary D. Nichols. This is great news for the health of Californias, Californians, the state's environment, and its economy, even as we face the failure of our na national leadership to address climate change. Senate Bill 32 signed in 2016 requires the state to go even further than AB 32 and cut, cut emissions 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, the most ambitious carbon goal in North America. I should also note that according to uh, that according to CARB, the 13% drop in carbon pollution since 2004 was achieved over a basic, uh, over a period in which the state economy grew 24%, a fact suggesting that addressing climate change isn't necessarily incompatible with economic growth. Okay. The state's per capita emissions continue to be among the lowest in the country and fell 23% from a peak to 14 metric tons per person in 2001 to 10.8 metric tons per person in 2016, approximately half as much as the national average. What is to be done? Obviously, the scale of the climate uh, problem demands more than piecemeal attention state by state basis. The modest recent developments I hear uh, report may make uh, many readers despair, but they suggest that first, the majority of the US public believes climate change is real and that percentage is increasing. Second, that despite the situation at the federal level, the Trump, with Trump in the White House and Congress, led by Republicans, state level progress on at least reducing current emissions levels is possible. Unfortunately, much more drastic action, action is necessary. And that last sentence uh, really sums it up. Because as much as this is, um, this is good news, at least for California, uh, we are still, we're still emitting, <laughs> you know, this much carbon. We're still pumping carbon into the air. Uh, we have not seen the full heating effect from the carbon already released globally. Again, globally, you know, we can um, take action in certain places, and I think that we should, but on a global level, um, emissions are rising, not falling. Um, and that is a serious problem. Uh, quickly, maybe I don't know if I'm going to cover this whole, this whole article, but just I'm going to touch on this. The city of Las Vegas is now powered entirely by renewable energy. And this is a misleading um, headline. Las Vegas just became the largest U.S. city to rely, rely solely on green energy to power its municipal facilities. So not the entire city of Las Vegas on at any stretch. So um, again, this is good news on a very, very minute um, level, but you know, nonetheless, I guess it's good news. 
all Las Vegas city facilities from government government buildings to streetlights are now running entirely on renewable energy, city officials have announced. We can brag that the city, the city of Las Vegas, is one of the few cities in the entire world that can boast, boast using all of its power from a green source, Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman said in a news conference Monday. The achievement marks the completion of the city's nearly decade-long goal to fully transition to clean energy only, a project that was expedited after the city partnered with public utility company NB Energy almost a year ago. While all government facilities are now only powered by renewable energy, many residential and commercial buildings are not. And you know, how many commercial buildings are there in Las Vegas? Quite a few and they're massive. Uh, officials were able to make the announcement after Bol Boulder Solar One, a massive solar array in the southeast corner of Nevada went online last week. Boulder Solar One, combined with other local sources of green energy like geothermal energy plants and solar panels placed throughout the city, will now provide 100% of the city's municipal power. The facility is owned by energy provider Southern Power and creates electricity bought by NV Energy and used by the city to power government services. The shift to renewable energy started in 2008 and has since saved the city uh, roughly $5 million annually and decreased energy consumption by more than 30% reports the Las Vegas Review Journal. Las Vegas, now the largest U.S. city to, to rely solely on renewable energy, is helping pave the way for other cities eager to transition to carbon-free energy despite an inco incoming presidential administration with a record of pushing back on progressive environmental policies. When is this from? What's the date? This is from 2016. Okay. Um, so this is quite a while ago. So definitely not going to read any more of that article, but um, the, I think this is good news. The problem is that the externalities of everything else that is going on in Las Vegas, the reality of, and this goes for California too. I wonder how much air travel was um, included in the, emissions report, uh, right? You know, because uh, air travel is quite a huge industry in California and it seems to be increasing all the time. And I don't see, I mean, the fact that we can, you know, have strong emissions uh, policies for cars is great. There are no emissions policies for airlines and they seem to only, you know, the output seems to be increasing. Um, air travel seems to be increasing. So I'm, I'm a little even skeptical of those numbers, but you know, we'll just call it a positive for now. Uh, but the reality of Las Vegas is that, you know, you have this huge, <laughs> you know, uh, city built on travel and tour tourism and, uh, and, you know, water use in a desert that cannot be possibly sustainable um, in the long run. Um, so there are many, many other problems facing Las Vegas, I think, uh, probably in the near future. Um, the main one being uh, water. <clears throat> but I don't know, you know, even if we, tr even if we Even if every single city was run on renewable energy, if ever, you know, if we converted everything to renewable energy, that would be awesome. But there was, there would still be, um, obviously, you know, there's still other things happening like pollution and, uh, it's, you know, other waste happening, uh, renewables rely on also, uh, rare earths mining. Let me find this comment because actually, um, this comment kind of summed it up better than I'm able to sum it up at the moment. So this, uh, actually the, the article came from, um, uh, Cash Krupa who posted this and we had a little back and forth and then Ohm, Posted this, the renewables argument is just yet another dimension of the climate crisis steeped in contradictions and uncertainties. I suppose we approach this predicament from an anthropogenic perspective, 
understandable given that we're humans. But imagine the crisis from another angle. From another angle gives rise to a completely different way of approaching it. Derek Jensen articulates our dilemma pretty well here. Too much environmentalism and especially climate activism has now been turned into a de facto lobbying arm for the industrial sector. It's a pretty neat trick on the part of capitalism and capitalists to turn very real, real concern over global warming into a vast movement. Uh, then use this mass movement to advance the aims of uh, specific sectors of the industrial capitalist economy. If you ask many of the protesters within this mass movement why they're protesting, they may tell you they're trying to save the planet. But if you ask them what their demands are, what are their demands, they may respond that they want additional subsidies for industrial solar, wind, hydro, and biomass sectors. That's a hell of a PR marketing coup. I'm not blaming individual protesters. They're not the problem. The problem is that what capitalism does and the real problem is that solar and hydro help industry, not the real world. Do desert tortoises need solar electric, uh, electricity generating facilities built on what used to be their homes? Do coho salmon need dams built on the rivers that used to be their homes? What about Mekong, Mekong catfish? To be clear, wild nature from desert bighorn sheep to Michigan monkey flowers to Johnson's seagrass doesn't benefit in the slightest from so-called alternative energies. Sure, in some cases, these alternative energies emit less carbon, and their oil and gas counterparts, but they still emit more carbon than if no uh, facility were built. And they destroy more habitat than if none were built. This is what part of what I mean when I say that solutions are meant to protect, in this case, power, the economy, rather than, than protect wild nature. Even leaving aside the fact that the electricity generated by renewables is used to power the industrial economy, in other words, to further the murder of the planet, the wind, solar, hydro, biomass solutions are in themselves harmful. For example, wind solar require the mining of rare earths. All mining is environmentally de devastating, but rare earths mining is especially so. Rare earths mining, uh, rare earths mining and refining is, it has devastated, for example, the area around uh, Baotou, China. As the Guardian wrote, from the air it looks like a huge lake fed by many tributaries, but on the ground it turns out to be a murky expanse of water in which no fish or algae can survive. The shore is coated with black crust, so thick you can walk on it. Into this huge 10 square kilometer tailings pond, nearby factories discharge water loaded with chemicals used to process the 17 most sought after minerals in the world, collectively known as rare earths. The soil in the region has also been toxified. Likewise, no matter how green and renewable, so many climate activists, politicians, and environmental, environmentalists claims dams, claim dams are, it should be obvious that dams kill rivers. They kill riparian zones, they inundate. They deprive rivers of the dams of nutrients uh, from andromus and andromus anadromus fish, or androm anadromus, excuse me, I don't even, I'm just tearing that up. They deprive floodplains below the nutrients that flow with rivers. They deprive beaches of sediment. They destroy habitat of fish and others who live in flowing rivers, not in slow moving warmer reservoirs. Uh, just a little talk on that, but you know, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to discount the fact that, you know, it, it is a step in the right direction. I'm just, you know, um, the main problem is that we don't, we don't have time to, and we're not going to be able to switch the entire world over to renewable energy, um, for it to have any major impact on what's happening with the climate. It's just not gonna happen fast enough, and we are still gonna be impacting the climate in all the other ways in which we impact the climate. Um, there has to be a real drawdown in uh, industrial civilization as we know it. Like we really need to just, you know, everything needs to be brought down. Um, you know, and definitely renewables and electric cars and all that stuff kind of like uh, encourages people to just keep on doing what they're doing. Um, and I don't think that that's possible. I don't know, unless we, we, we just don't have time. If we had a hundred more years <coughs> to get to a point where, you know, we're, we have fine tuned, you know, green technology or, um, technology to the point where we are using, um, you know, no fossil fuels and we are able to live sustainably and not, you know, destroy the rest of the earth with 
shipping and air travel and uh, deforestation and palm oil and you know uh, overfishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and radiation. Like uh, we ha we have to tackle all of those other issues as well. Um, so it feels like on some level that all of this is a very large band aid. But I'm not going to discourage people from. I would rather people uh, really become uh, really, you know, take into consideration their footprint and the footprint of a civilization, uh, large and small. Anyways, moving on. Uh, last article. I had something else I want to read, and I don't know where it went, but I'll find it and probably read it tomorrow. But let's read this today. Supersonic jets for the ultra-rich could be a climate change disaster. The revival of the futuristic planes threatens large environmental consequences, a new report finds. Fifteen years after the last Concorde flew, a new fleet of up to 2,000 supersonic business jets in the, in the works to ferry wealthy travelers around the world. The planes are expected to hit the runway in the next decade, but the climate change alarms are already going off. President Donald Trump, of course, has hailed the supersonic revival as an example of the great American spirit. NASA dropped a $247 million contract on Lockheed Martin to build a quieter engine capable of breaking the sound barrier. Climate advocates, meanwhile, are pointing to a new report released Tuesday by the high released Tuesday by the nonprofit International Council on Clean Transportation that offers heavy criticism of the next generation of ultra-fast business jets. The ICCT, which uncovered the Volkswagen diesel emission scandal, warns that increased emissions from the new jet risks large environmental consequences. Its report concluded that the planes will burn five to seven times more fuel than normal aircraft and break United Nations set carbon dioxide emissions limits for aircraft by 70%. People should be worried. Daniel Rutherford, one of the report's authors, told HuffPost. We know that even without these supersonic jets, emissions from the in, uh, international aviation are expected to triple by 2050. Rutherford said he had not seen estimates that by then, domestic and international aviation could account for about a quarter of the global carbon budget envisioned under the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We might be looking at a tip, might just be looking at the tip of the iceberg here, he said. Billions of dollars are reportedly invest, being invested in new supersonic designs by the U.S. startups, such as Boom, Arion, and Spike, with predictions coming uh, that 1, 000, some 1,000 to 2,000 of the futuristic business jets could be flying by 2035. Oh, boy. Arion told the site Climate Home News that it sees a market for 600 supersonic planes, which would be focused on a very small and wealthy niche. Those prepared to spend thousands of dollars to shave a few hours off of transoceanic flight times. The small size of the potential consumer base serves to highlight the environmental issues. As Bill Hemmings, aviation director of the Brussels-based Transport and Environmental uh, Think Tank said, the ICCT report suggests that even a small fleet will do enormous damage to the climate. Is that publicly acceptable for a very modest decrease in flying time for 0.1% of the flying population? Or as Hemmings put it more sharply, why should a small segment of the population be exempted from the Paris Agreement just because they want to travel faster? Ding. Supersonic, supersonic commercial flights, which travel faster than the speed of sound, have been grounded since 2003 when poor passenger numbers and high costs led to the withdrawal of the Concorde jet fleet from service. It was the crash of an Air France Concorde in Paris, pulling 113 people that sparked a chain of events ending in the jet's retirement. But public concerns about the ear-splitting sonic boom and takeoff noise had already emerged with anxieties about nitri uh, nitrogen dioxide pollution and climate change. Supersonic, jet, uh, supersonic jets emit far more carbon dioxide than traditional planes because of the heavier weight, their heavier weight, and the consequent amount of fuel needed to take off and break the sound barrier. Those emissions of carbon dioxide and water va vapor take place at 60,000 feet, around double the altitude of normal aircraft. That affects the balance between the sunlight that reaches the Earth and the energy reflected back into space. In a process known as radi radiative forcing that may dramatically boost global warming. Now the ICCT report suggests just how significant the jet's carbon emissions could be. Brad Schaller, Deputy Director of the World Wildlife, Wildlife Fund US said, it's quite daunting that supersonics could have five to seven times the emission of subsonic aircraft. 
when we need to reach zero emissions this century for a safe climate future. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna stop for a second because they're not even talking about military flights, right? How many military flights? How much fuel is used? How many emissions? Uh, are, is that even being calculated? Does anybody know the numbers on that? I wonder. Are those are they available? I wonder. Uh, and then you know times that by every other military you know large military power in the world. Uh, I don't know how many countries have uh, planes that I'm sure you know just burn through thousands of gallons of fuel. Uh, so we're not even talking, we're, we're just talking about the public sector. International aviation is one of the, uh, or the, the private sector, I don't know, the non-military sector. International aviation is one of the fastest growing sources of emissions. The sector emitted about 850 million metric tons of carbon dioxide in 2015, roughly the same as Germany's total national contribution. Wow. Put it in another way, airplanes are responsible for more than 2% of global greenhouse gas emission. When radiative forcing is considered, their contribution to global warming has been pegged at 5%. But there are no meaningful global emissions regulations yet for supersonics, and none seems likely until the new prototypes have been tested and built. But then, by then, it may be too late, according to Hemmings. The manufacturers now have Trump support, and they're pushing for quick certification. I, you know, I actually, I have to say that probably 5% is incredibly conservative. Very, very low, I'm sure. Uh, and when we talk about how quickly global warming went up from the lack of global dimming by just U.S. Air, air, airplanes being grounded after 9-11, um, you know, the, the real effects on the environment of air travel probably aren't, aren't even being calculated as far as like uh, what they're, you know, what they have done to the skies, what they have done to the atmosphere, what they are doing to the atmosphere currently, how much they're holding down, warming, if they all stop flying. I mean, it's, uh, and then we have military flights and then we have, you know, whatever it is <laughs> that is going on that people don't want to talk about or admit is happening, then, you know, we have all that stuff. Uh, air travel is a huge can of worms. The flights may be stopped by regulation from the International Civil Aviation Organization, the United Nations body that spelled out carbon dioxide limits for airplanes, but the ICAO, oh, there are limits for airplanes? I mean, are there? How, and how they enforce these? The ICAO can't write regulations on supersonic jets without the manufacturer's data. That information may not arrive until after a powerful head of steam has built up to support the planes. ICAO is on the job. I'm sure that just, you know, planes emit whatever they emit and then, you know, the regula regulatory bodies are like, okay, and that's the limit. You know, whatever it is you're admitting, that's what it is. Don't admit anymore, okay? Uh, early rumblings of a supersonic clash between the U.S. and Europe were felt last week amid a reported U.S. attempt to weaken global noise standards <clears throat> to smooth the way for the jets. Sonic booms and noise created by the Concorde's takeoff and landings were so severe that in 1973, the FAA banned supersonic travel over U.S. territory. David Whiteley, communications director for the trade group Air Force Council International, told HuffPost, airports around the world have a strong record of working with communities to limit impacts on the local environment. That needs to continue and it needs to be in the minds of the aviation industry. As supersonic jets are developed, they should not be noisier or more polluting than their subsonic counterparts. Electric and hybrid aircraft, as well as the innovative technologies such as power to liquid low carbon fuels, are more deserving of investment than these jets. Well, yes. As for any self styled green on entrepreneurs getting behind the new planes, think Richard Branson, who has backed the supersonic comeback as the next big thing, Shallard added. Cannot speak from different sides of your mouth on aviation's climate impact. And yeah, 
who knows what the actual impact is? Who knows what is being reported? Um, you know, we have in this day and age the whole like, oh my God, Trump is ruining the environment and he's gutting the EPA. And, you know, try to remember that before Trump, the EPA, you know, was doing a lot to green light things that shouldn't have been going on. I mean, the industrial, you know, pollution and industrial civilization was going full steam before Trump. While we had an EPA that supposedly had people that cared, right? Um, perhaps they were doing more regulating, you know, of course, maybe they had more, more stops in place for certain things, but we had uh, oil spills and uh, chemical refinery spills and, you know, fracking and, you know, on and on and on. We had so many things going on and we had an EPA. We had a quote unquote functioning EPA under, you know, all presidents before Trump. And, you know, I don't see that they were doing a whole hell of a lot better as far as actually keeping, uh, you know, things from going totally awry. I mean, which they have. Um, you know, obviously, in the best of all possible worlds, we would have an EPA that, you know, actually had uh, more of a conscience than, uh, than corporations and, you know, an EPA that could actually um, really take corporations to task, an EPA that could actually stand up to corporations, could stand up to the government and say, like, this needs to happen and to hell with y'all to hell with your money making schemes and your, you know, uh, profit margins. Um, but that clearly wasn't really happening, uh, full scale. So, um, truly we are in a bad time with what Trump is doing to the EPA with the direction the EPA is going in. Um, but I don't know, we need, you know, obviously something on a much more drastic level. For even going to, if we were going to get even close to tackling uh, climate change or any of these problems, um, it's going to have to be on such a such a major level. You know, <clears throat> again, it would have to be the primary concern of of the government. Period. End of story. <laughs> you know, the government would have to actually be interested in putting the environment and the living earth above profits or industrial civilization. Um, how that might actually come to fruition, I have no idea. If anybody, anybody else has an idea, please uh, feel free. In the comments, let me know. Uh, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you'd like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Hope to be back tomorrow with another video. Until next time, peace. Thank you.